Well, Stephen Levine used to call this the dying project. Oh, right. And I got tired of explaining to people that, first of all, the project wasn't dying. I was like, the dying project, right? <laughs> <laughs> or, on the other hand, that you had to promise to die to come to work with us. Because it really isn't about dying, it's about healing, it's about transformation of consciousness. And so living slash dying, it's about the slash. It's about how dying informs living and living informs dying, and that interface, uh -huh. which is the between. The between there, that's what the, that's what the project is about. Very good. Very good. Shall we do the sutra? The what, Sweetie? How many people have you seen die? I have no idea. How I many people not, what? How, how many people has Dale seen die? Oh, how many have you seen die? I, uh, I have not kept track. Many, many, many people. And uh, it's not always the case I'm right there at the moment of death. Often I am, often I'm not. Uh, as I say, I work with people all around the world. And we have a program where nowadays uh, I like to have our volunteers work with somebody who's dying so other people are getting this training and experience. And then I get either friends or friends of friends or the really difficult cases. Mm -hmm. And I leave the more normal dying process to the volunteers. One thing I will say that has really surprised me is that, uh, first of all, we get very few people who are the ideal Living Dying Project client. Almost nobody has really thought much about dying before they give me a call. Uh, very few people have done a lot of meditation practice. They have some vague notion that if they brought in some vague spiritual component to their healing modalities, that it would be a good thing. And the other thing that has really changed over the years is that when I first started doing this, when I moved from Santa Fe, where we had the dying center, back to California, right before my father started dying, uh, we were the only people doing this. And so, for instance, the Hospice of Marin, the second oldest hospice in America, the only one that's older is the New Haven Hospice, had, as their spiritual support team, a very nice Episcopalian lady. So if you were a very nice Episcopalian, she was perfect for you. But for a lot of other people, not so much. So we got a lot of referrals. But now, all these other agencies, the hospices, the hospitals, they have spirit rock meditators and Wiccans and oh, every, right. every imaginable kind of person who do not have the depth of training that our volunteers have. But it's hard to convince these agencies that they don't have the whole thing covered. So I have a continual marketing problem, or task, if you will, to have the name out there. Because if you hear about the Living Dying Project, and in the moment you don't need us, you don't have a dying relative or friend or something, it's information that goes in one ear and right out the other ear. Sure. And then three months later, Aunt Sadie or mom or whatever gets this diagnosis, you don't remember us. So. Uh, it's, we're, we're offering something for free that's really quite wonderful. And still, it's hard to give it away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's kind of. But in a way, by stimulating so many other people to learn to do it and so on. Yeah. You have so, given it away indirectly, at least whatever fragment they can, they can accept. Very good. And it, 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 it is pretty much the case that between uh, Stephen Levine, Frank Kostaseski, Joan Halifax, myself, Ram Dass, that many tens of thousands of people have taken trainings and that they are embedded in hospitals and hospices and families mm -hmm. all around America. So even though this particular hospice doesn't say, we offer this fantastic spiritual support, there is a nurse there, or there is a social worker there right. who is meditating and who has taken this training and is really very much in tune with everything that we're talking about here. Uh, when we first began doing this work, Ram Dass, Stephen, and I, we thought, this is fantastic. This is just what America needs. There's so much denial here. And we're going to start this dying center, and we will be the Colonel Sanders of death. And that soon there will be, <laughs> there will be a dying center in 
every community in America. And 10 years later, we were still the only one. That we, really? we really underestimated the depth to which fear of death is embedded yeah. in our society. And now both Ramdas and Stephen, in fact, you could keep them, Ramdas and Stephen and Andrea, you could keep them in your prayers because none of them are doing very well physically at all. Well, I thought uh, Stephen had already gone. No, he's there. He's no, Stephen up. is, he's bed bound and he fell oh. out of bed and he's, uh, oh. we were very worried about Stephen. Andre was very worried about Stephen. And now Andre is worse than Stephen. And they live at the end of a 13-mile dirt road that is impassable when it rains. Oh, no. In Santa Fe area. Well, no, it's outside of Taos, way in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. And Ramdas is paralyzed on one side. He fell down and injured the other side. So he has no sides that work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? That's... Was that recently? Yeah, pretty recently. We should go see him in January. Then. I would go. Oh my. Okay. Yeah. Ready, S Susan? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Can you hold it or just about before this? Okay, yeah. please. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't hear. <laughs> okay, is sir. all the superficiality in our society like the Kardashians part of the denial of death? I see. Yes. I think so. At the same time, the baby boom generation is at a certain age, and demographics are on our side. So uh, as your parents get ill, as our friends get ill, as we get ill, uh, it what we're talking about here becomes much more crucial to many, many people. Actually, oh yes, okay, I have some one thing to say about that. When, when uh, there's a funny thing about the Tibetan Book of Natural Liberation, Book of the Dead, which is that it was said to have brought, been brought to Tibet in the 8th century, and then was rediscovered in the 14th century, and was not available for the use of the Tibetan people besides some adepts for 700 years, therefore, or 600 years. And I, was, I, I reflected about that and about the, the denial of death in our society. And um, I had like a eureka moment. And the reason that death is, is forcibly denied in cultures, in the case of Tibet of that ancient time, it was due to militarism, I believe. And um, because it wasn't industrial, that was sort of the industry of uh, Imperial Tibet. And it took a long time to wean the culture off of that because it's due to the influence of Buddhism. And in our case, it's a combination of militarism and industrialism, both. Because if you take uh, Kubler-Ross's great statement that in the many thousands of people she'd been with at death, not a single one regretted not spending another day at the office, she, uh, if you connect that, then a society's sort of official ideology doesn't want people thinking about death, who they want to either risk their lives or give up their lives to fight somebody, or uh, work slave away in some industrial productivity enforced, like you do nothing if you don't produce, culture. Because once people start thinking about the death, they start thinking about, well, what's the meaning of my life? And what am I doing with it? And should I really be just Charlie Chaplin in modern times like a cog in the wheel? Or should I be doing something to fulfill my potential? So they start resisting sort of collectivist outlook. You know, that, that you need for militarism. You need people to be willing to throw their life away for the bosses will, you know, wish to conquer a few oil wells or some nonsense, which has nearly nothing to do with you. Or, or you, need the, you need to be not be thinking just like a herd mentality, collective mentality, to just work in someone's factory for, for, and waste your life that way, actually, basically, and have a corporate raider steal your pension in the last, last year before you retire, and besides not be able to pay your rent and your mortgage and your whole thing, and just be a slave, basically, all your life. And um, 
So the introduction of the awareness of death is actually the beginning of true individualism in a society. Not the fake one that America pretends to itself that we're all very individualistic, but actually we're highly conformist and very manipulable by bad leaders and so on. Very much have a, what the, what the associate the Frankfurt School came up with about that the Germans following the Nazis out of their desperate economic situation, the authoritarian personality, you know, willing to be following some idiot uh, and throw your life in the, in the, under the bus driven by the idiot. Because you think about death and you say, no way, <laughs> what am I doing with these moments of my life that, are, that at least benefit me, if not help many others, but at least benefit me? Why am I wasting my time doing this or that? You know, going down this or that tunnel? You know? So I, it really does connect with a, a society that is confident enough, is open enough, possibly wealthy enough to tolerate its, and even desire its individuals to be really concerned with fulfilling themselves. And if the society basically wants the individuals to be enslaved to whatever its collective purpose is, they're not going to encourage them to think about death. Because death is, is the great individual moment. You know, your family ties are gone, your possessions are gone, your status is gone. It's just you, and where are you, and what are you? And then, if you, once you get that attitude, you become the dying lies. <laughs> Meaning, you're, you're more and more alive because you realize you're dying. You're in the bardo of life between birth and death, right? Do you see any cultures that going in that direction? Uh, it, well, we are, I think. California is ahead of the East Coast, until you came. <laughs> but but uh, seriously, it is, and uh, and uh, a and uh, we are doing that, and you know, like there was an article just the other day in some one of the papers, I think I can't forget where I read it, or maybe the Economist, where um, some recruiter down in Georgia or some place was going around with the, the journalist, you know, the reporter, and talking about meeting all kinds of people in some little village very poor people who normally they would be recruiting like mad, you know, mostly blacks. And then they were very friendly with the re re recruiter and he also had some goodies he gave them. <laughs> but he said they don't really join, they don't want to. They're not, they realize it's ridiculous, you know. And uh, it's not really gonna help them, you know, and they rather would hang out and make their best way in their poverty there and, and be free. And so I think it's become a big cultural thing that they can't mobilize people into these things, you know, very easily. It's very difficult. You know, there's no draft anymore. You know, there's no, where is the manpower and woman power? And uh, it's not there, you know. And that's a good sign. And I think there, there's a worldwide resistance to all of this. In China, they have 350,000 to 400,000 extreme riots against the Communist Party every year. That's like a thousand a day, if you add that up, and uh, and they have more money they spend suppressing than they do. Although they probably hide some of their military expenditure, but they they have more money to try to suppress the dissatisfaction of their own people of they're being coerced into slave labor, which is what it is. My one lama who came here in the '70s, the one I went with to the different Native American people, as ambassador of Dalai Lama quietly, when he was leaving, he was in New York at a party by some, some very hip people, supposedly. And um, they asked him, Rinpoche, how do you like America, that day? And he said, well, I enjoyed very much. It's a really nice country, and I had a nice time, he says, but it reminded me a little bit too much of communist China. <laughs> 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 he said, and people were horrified. <laughs> and was this Lama had been in the 50s, he was in the party of the entourage of the Dalai Lama who went down in 54 for almost a year to try to cope with Mao and deal with the whole Chinese invasion and everything. And so he'd, spent, he'd been all around in communist China, he'd seen things. And then people said, well, how can you say that in all this place? What, you know, this is our great individual land of the free and all this place, how can you say that? And he said, well, yes, he said, your houses are nicer, you have cars, you have the things, he said, but in both cases, nobody has any time at all. You all just work all the time. And like I stay even, I've been staying in people's very kindly hosting me and wealthy houses and the guy welcomes me and then 
the guy has three phones in the house and he's talking all the whole time and trading and doing things and, he, they, and I'm there a week and they never talk to me because they have <laughs> no time. And in communist China, 14 hours a day, they're out there catching the sparrows, doing the roads, working for the people, et cetera. I said, there was nobody had a minute of any freedom of time. He said, in Tibet, sometimes we worked very hard. In the villages, there was, there was plowing in the farm villages. In the nomadic ones, they had to milk, milk yaks and so on. And, uh, but then, and in the monasteries, we had exam time, and we had certain rituals, and we had to prepare to do things. But there were a lot of time when we just you know, said our prayers, we just hung out, we didn't, the people didn't do anything. They sewed something, they did a little something, hung out with each other. And it was like really pleasant in that way. And, and you people have no fun, he said. What's so, the fun? <laughs> it was in the 70s, you know. Right. But I thought it was very, very thought-provoking, actually. And the 70s was kind of a fun time compared to now. Well, oh, I don't know about that. It depends. I mean, if you look at the <laughs> mass, what's going on. Also, the other, well, there's a great cartoon in here in the New Yorker. It's a Times Square, you know, a Times Square thing. Yeah. And yeah. then all the signs are not selling this and that. One is saying, you're too fat. You're ugly. You're thirsty. You're hungry. You're truly, you're very ugly. You're really fat. <laughs> All the signs are saying that to people. Because <laughs> they want them, their products are going to help them be less so. You know? I thought there was going to be another cartoon where there was a father and a son in Times Square, which was in a recent edition. And the son is looking at all the signs, and the father says, This is going to count as part of your screen time today. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, that's actually smarter than father. OK. All right. Okay, in Sanskrit. Bhagavati Pradhyaparamita Hrdaya In Tibetan, Chandendema Sharapachinimbo In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom No, no, you don't have a sutra. I know you're in doing your usual protest. We're doing it in collective. But, you know, it's a great meditation. You're meditating on no eye, no ear, no nose. It's very important. This is really the heart of the whole thing. It's the heart of the Lady Buddha, the heart of the clear light of the void, who is the great mother. <laughs> Thus did I hear Here on a certain grace. occasion the blessed, blessed Lord, Lord was, was dwelling, dwelling on, on the vulture, vulture peak at Rajagaha, Rajagaha together, together with great, with great communities, communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. And bodhisattvas. At that, At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called the illumination of the profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shakraputra addressed the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when, when any, any noble son wishes to engage in the, in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Shariputra thus, Shariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter. Neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousness are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, soundless, uncreated, unceased. Stainless, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no, no sensation, no conception, no, no mental, mental function, function, no consciousness, no, no eye, no, no ear, no, no nose, no tongue, no, no body, no mentality, no, no form or color, color no, no sound, no scent, no, no taste, no, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media, from eye to mentality sense media. And there, and there are, are no consciousness media, media from visual to mental consciousness mind either. either. There, there are, are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance, and so on up to no old age and death, and no, no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, Likewise there, there are no suffering, no origination, no, no cessation, no, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. 
Therefore, Shariputra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, she lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. Her spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future and transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood, unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great, of great science, science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely, uniquely universal mantra, the mantra, mantra that, that eradicates all suffering. suffering. It, it is not false and should be known as truth. truth. The, the transcendent wisdom mantra as follows. Om Gate Gate Padagate Padasam Gate Bodhisvaha. Om Gate Gate Padagate Padasam Gate Bodhisvaha. Om Gate Gate Padagate Padasam Gate Bodhisvaha. Shariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Lavagateshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the, when the blessed Lord had spoken thus, the venerable Shasadvatiputra, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoiced and all applauded what the Buddha said. So everyone remember the nose meditation, right, where you couldn't find your nose? So they, he mentions no nose. And this is why it may be shocking to people who have mostly been exposed to uh, you know, Theravada-type Buddhism, and also the translations even of Mahayana by 19th century English translators and so on, where they were really delighted with the idea of no soul, no self. And they thought Buddha was picking on self and soul as the main thing, which was no. <laughs> but you note, know, and in addition to no soul and no self, when he's in the no, no mood, there's no nose, no eye, no ear, no everything. So therefore, we can have back whatever thing that is, means something to someone. <clears throat> minus, once you understand that it's minus the idea of being an absolute, fixed, independent, self-subsistent, self self intrinsically real thing. You know, in other words, if, and then you begin to relate to everything in your life about yourself and about the world as you're so, it's there, but you sort of know that if you really try to grab it, it's going to be no. You know, it's, it'll disappear under analysis. So that means it's kind of simultaneously there and not there. And you begin to realize that. And then you begin to be more light about your connection to it, including your body, including your pe pleasures, including your pains. And it's no, if you really look for it, it'll dissolve, even your pleasure or your pain will dissolve under analysis. And so, when you, so when, as you cultivate that more and more, you are beginning to combine death, which is, after all, no life. You're combining that with life. And that's the deathless. That's when it's clear life. That's when you, know, you can't die, because death is in everything around you, in the sense that you, you're, willing, you're living with it all and willing to let it all go at any instant. And then, you're, then you're, you're cool, then you're out of a job, then your marketing is shot and everybody's like that. <laughs> but that's good, then you're happy to be out of that. <laughs> I'm trying and to then think. You, oh, then everyone will carry around on top of their head, you know, like they do with those llamas, don't worry. <laughs> you and Ram Dass can be sitting there. Like, Ram Dass is like, give me another stroke, Guruji. <laughs> Maybe not. What? Maybe, Maybe not. <laughs> well, he purports to. Fierce grace. <laughs> yeah. I, I know the backstory, but that's I know. Story. <laughs> I, I, know the, I know him since he was Richard Alfred in 1959. Yeah. Anyway, let's not go down that road. Okay. Too far. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So if, if I could add just one comment. Yeah, that, of course. Uh, very often, 
people are not in touch with their body. They're in touch with the concept of their body, mm -hmm. which is really what uh, Bob is talking about and in, in a more simple way of looking at it. Are we really in touch with our mind or a concept of our mind? Are we in touch with another person mm -hmm. or a concept of another person? Mm -hmm. So there is a, there is a very important uh, understanding in Buddhism, in Theravada Buddhism, of impermanence. That everything is always changing. And so when we really have this concept that I have a nose, or I have a friend, or I have whatever it might be, uh, we try to make something permanent because the impermanence, the constant dying of moment to moment to moment is very frightening to the ego structure. And learning to get in touch with the impermanence in a moment-to-moment -moment way, like right now, that the sound of my voice is changing each moment. If you try to grab onto it, as soon as it's there, it's gone. As soon as it's there, it's gone. And in fact, according to the Theravada Buddhists, one of the, the stages right before the first stage of enlightenment is this very pleasurable experience where in each moment you're aware how everything is being born. There's, there's an arising each moment. Wherever you're looking, something is being born. But the next stage, which is the stage right before enlightenment, is very frightening because in each moment everything is dying. And as soon as you experience something, it's gone. There is nothing solid. Your sense of self is not solid. Your sense of anything is not solid. And unfortunately, I had the experience of going into this state at the very end of a retreat so the retreat was over, and I was in the place where everything was dying, and all of a sudden I was in a Volkswagen on, in a freeway on Los Angeles, <laughs> going 60 miles an hour, looking out the window at another guy going 60 miles an hour, and everything was dying. Uh -oh. And it, it, it would have been nice if I had a few more days to kind of go through that, that stage. But the point is that when we get to this deeper understanding, if that's the correct word, that everything is impermanent, everything is dying, and that we don't have to wait until we get the prognosis from the doctor. We don't have to wait till we hear the bad news or our friend has the bad news. That right now, anything that you're experiencing is dying. And that's dying, and that's dying. So that, can we surf that? Can we just be on that edge? Can we just be enjoying the bliss of impermanence? Or are we resisting that? Are we needing something to be solid so that we can have some sense of false security, if you will? OK. One other thing I'd like to briefly mention, if I might. Uh, people have asked me questions about Tantra. And there is, uh, I'm much more expert in Hindu Tantra than Tibetan Tantra. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's yoga and there's Tantra. Those are the two main branches of understanding in Hinduism. Yoga means yoke. It means yoking yourself to the sacred. And we do that by controlling things. What goes in your mouth, what goes out of your mouth, what you do with your sexual organs, how you sleep, how you breathe, how you move your body. And it is very difficult to be a true yogi in postmodern Western society uh, for very obvious reasons. Uh, to, to truly be a, yoga, a yogi or a yogini, you need to have a very pure diet, you need to have a a, a very controlled way of sleeping and, and breathing and breathing clean air and doing all those things. The other path is the path of Tantra. And in the path of Tantra, the understanding is that everything is the mother. All form, all thought, all energy, anything that can be experienced, anything that is experiencing, is the mother. And that Tantra is the process of coming into union with loving the mother in all of her forms. So that uh, if we are truly a tantric practitioner, a glass of whiskey is just as much the mother as a cup of chamomile tea. 
a uh, piece of red meat is as much the mother as a, a piece of uh, blackened tempeh, which we had for dinner last night. But Tantra is a very tricky process because when we really start loving things and opening up into them in a deep enough way, the degrees of pleasure that can arise are quite remarkable. And it is very easy to get stuck there without somebody who gives you a little kick in the butt when you start getting attached to certain mind states or certain body states. So we're kind of stuck here in the West trying to find our own path. Very few people have a teacher who says, now is the time to be a vegetarian and now is the time to get divorced and now you should go to Tibet and go around Mount Kailash, and then you should come back and you should uh, study Iyengar yoga. We have to make those decisions ourselves. And part of who's making those decisions is the place where we're stuck, the place where we're afraid, our ego structure. So having the scriptures, having the scriptures like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and being able to go back to that, even if we don't have a day-to-day -day teacher that we're living with, is really of profound importance. Many of these scriptures say that it is of profound importance to have a mentor, to have a teacher who has a direct lineage to impart to you. And most of us are stuck with people like Bob and me, which <laughs> <laughs> although there are certainly many wonderful teachers. And I will say that any wisdom I have is only a direct result of my having been around other great teachers. It's nothing that I have created. It's by being around great lamas, being around my guru, being around great saints. So that if you ever have the opportunity to be around a being of light, then uh, it is certainly something that I would deeply encourage you to do, as well as encourage you to be around a being who is dying. If you if you have a relative or a friend who's dying, and even if it requires you to put your job on hold for a while and, great, and make some great sacrifice, it can be a profound uh, positive impulse to your practice to have an intimate relationship with death, to really be with someone as their consciousness is leaving their body, to, and by that, I mean not just that moment, but the, the hours and days before, the hours and days after, being with that process that we're talking about here, but really living that. And my experience as the director of the Living Dying Project is that again and again, our volunteers, who are often people who've been meditating for decades, many of them are Berkeley psychotherapists who wear Berkeley psychotherapist shoes, I don't know if you know what they look like, but if you're from Berkeley, you would know what they look like. Okay. They kind of lace up and they're kind of pointy at the end. Anyway. You don't have to... Okay. Okay. That even somebody like that, when I call them up and say, it's time for you to be with your first client, uh, she says, I'm thinking of a particular person now, I'm not ready to do this. I said, Barbara, you've been meditating for 20 years. You've been a therapist for 25 years. You, this man needs you. And she said, I don't, I don't think I can do it. And I said, you have to do it. He needs you. So she went to see this man, and he was just a few days from dying. And he said, I've been meditating for so many years, and I can't even die well. I'm a failure at dying. Oh. And Barbara said, who, who is saying that? And he thought and said, my god, it's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she never said I could do anything right. She won't even let me die well. So they talked about that, and, and he realized that he could go beyond that relationship with his mother. And apparently I was not there, but this, this fellow died in a, a, a seemingly a great deal of freedom. So uh, that's just an encouragement to do this work. You don't have to be a Living Dying Project volunteer. If you do take that training online, you can be an adjunct volunteer. You get a certificate, and there's online support groups and things if you want. But you find your own clients in your community, and it, it is such a great addition to an inner contemplative practice. Okay. Thank you very much. One last thing. 
right. And one last thing, and then over, over to you. So, so in, in, terms, in terms of Tantra, even if you don't have a Tantra teacher, there are some what they call beyond practice things you can do. There are three main things that I've been playing with. The first one is to be receiving the grace or the blessing that is inherent in each moment. In other words, going beyond the content of experience, living, dying, pain, pleasure, whatever it is, in any of those moments, there is this radiant blessing that's available. And by practicing some of the foundation practices we've been talking about the last couple days, being embodied, grounded and centered, having a foundation in compassion, one can begin to tune into that level of blessing that is right now here available in each moment. The next non-practice is to be with perception as it arises before there is any understanding or analysis of it. So in each moment there is perception and we create concepts about perception. So being on that, surfing that edge of that wave of just being with perception without getting the mind involved in any conceptual way at all allows you then to begin to have this love relationship with the mother, with the blessing that is available. And the third non-practice that they talk about is non-conceptual mantra. Just a sound like om or ah or hri, something that doesn't take you into your mind. It's not like hail the jewel in the lotus or uh, Hare Krishna or something, but just the sound itself going into the sound takes you into that realm of pure perception. And these are things I played with, I found often quite delightful. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Book of uh, Awe and Wonder, the uh, Lakshmanju, the Sh Shaivite Kashmiri Tantra ways of. Uh, oh, that's nice. Book of Awe and Wonder by Lakshmanju. Well, it's a, he was one of the translators. I can, I can send people the, the name of it, if you will. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, NYU Press, the Stony, whatever may be, one of those where they have. Anyway, I apologize. Like the name of it, or you're not sure of the name of it? The Book of Awe and Wonder, I think oh, it's okay. called. That sounds very good. So, yes, a question. I'm sorry? Is that the Divyambi of Hare Tantra? Is that the that concept? Yes. yes. So the book is free to us also. Like yeah, it's, it's translated in any number of ways, and that's just one of the, yeah. the more sexy titles that they threw on that translation. Okay, yeah, Bhairava. Well, Bhairava means terrifying. Bhairava means. They call it Vijnana Bhairava. Bhairava means terrifying. There's actually a much more accessible book. Is the book called uh, uh, Paul Reps's book? Uh, what's this book about Zen? Oh, uh, Reps, yeah. Well, I forget Zen something. Yeah. Zen flesh, Zen bones. Zen flesh, Zen bones. And as part of that, he has uh, many of the more usable verses from that tantra. So that, that might be the way to go. A book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, 10 ox herding pictures, uh, Kashmiri, Shaivite, Tantrism, lovely okay. book. So when we start talking about the book, does that throw us into a concept? Do we get caught in, oh, book, I need to get the book because I need to get from <laughs> here to there. It's so hard not to do that, right? Yes. Actually, what you say about uh, pure perception without imposing concepts is uh, foundational in Tibetan epistemology. Indian, uh, Dignaga, Dharmakirti, the great Indian logician, they are sort of the, they, they preceded the Kantian discovery that the sort of basic material of sensations, he, could, he used the word intuition, actually. He didn't use the word perception. But... Um, sense intuition and intellectual intuition, meaning unmediated by a concept. Right. But usually to most people that's inaccessible because the concept happens so fast. So, but it's a beautiful thing and it, it's, a, it's a very sort of technical epistemological way 
of connecting to the, that idea, that ordinary experience, sort of un, uh, unanalyzed and unrecognized even, is actually the enlightened experience that everyone has all the time but doesn't right. notice because they only notice what they can, they can grasp of the concept. So they, they express it in terms of when you see the wall, the white wall there, there's two things that you do. One, you see the white wall. The other one is you see the quote, white, unquote, quote, wall, unquote. Right. But most of us only see the quote, white, unquote, we think. There's that first split second of just encountering it without recognizing what is its power or identifying it, in other words, is uh, inaccessible to most of us. But, it, but it, it would be a good thing to leave. There must be a way of trying to go at it and I, to I, think I th that you're doing it without recognizing it. But it's not easy to do. But it's good to notice how the, the concepts keep interfering. Oh, yeah. Or even that, you know, even that there's something underneath the concept, absolutely. Very interesting. Very interesting. The Shaiva Tantras, particularly, and uh, the, the Tibetan Tantras, which are the Indian, the late Indian Tantras, they're very interconnected in Kashmir and Bengal, actually, from uh, an Indian history. And there's a whole story about it, but I don't want to go into that now. I thought, actually, it'd be very more useful for people if we, in this morning, we did a couple, like one mild deity and one fierce deity together, and just do it as a meditative thing, where you, we will go into meditation, we'll all be meditating it, imagining it, and we will hear the instruction from the uh, friend. Oh, about the teacher, I wanted to say something about the teacher and the guru thing, because you mentioned about Hinduism and Buddhism. One thing about Buddhism is that in monastic Buddhism and in regular exoteric Buddhism, the guru role is very diminished and the teacher model is, is, is a very nice one called Kalyana Mitra, which means a virtuous friend. So the idea of the teacher is of rather a friend and a companion who may be a little bit more ahead of you or know something you don't or be able to help you with something, but they sort of try to deconstruct as much as possible the Indian patriarchal family idea of the authoritarian father, you know, which gets very much in the guru thing, as you know, the Sanskrit word guru's root meaning is heavy. <laughs> Literally, guru means heavy. And you know, like the father is heavy on the top of the family in the Indian patriarchal family. So Buddhism deconstructs that in regular study and teaching. But then in this advanced teaching, which they made uh, esoteric, because people could misunderstand it you know, if they were not really didn't have some preparatory cultivation. Uh, then the guru thing comes back. And, um, and then they, because the guru is, has to, uh, the proper one should either channel or exemplify the state or the attainment that one wishes to gain. And even sometimes someone who is not themselves enlightened, if they are properly fitted within the tradition, they can be serve as a kind of icon, just like you know, this is a statue of, we're still not sure, either Avalokiteshvara or Manjushri. And obviously we don't think that's Avalokiteshvara or Manjushri. But if someone uses that as a channel of the presence of Avalokiteshvara, compassion, Manjushri, wisdom, then it can have a usefulness. So similarly, the Lama figure, or the Guru figure in Tantra, even someone who's not that enlightened themselves, if they have, if they have done the preparatory work, if they have the devotion themselves, if there's a chain of in back somewhere reaching an enlightened teacher, somewhere, it could be several generations back actually, then the student who is using that channel to try to contact the enlightened being, whether it's that immediate one they're facing or one further back, can use that being as an icon, so to speak. So, and, and then the, uh, the yoga of the student, the mental yoga of the student in that case, is to see that teacher in the initiatory setting as flawless, and all flaws are in the student's own perception. However, something which has not been much addressed, leading to much of the guru abuse in the West, and also people's feeling like, oh, I can't do anything, I don't have a guru, where's my guru? Sort of excessive kind of thing of like, it's like needing the book. You know, it's like, well, I got to get the book, then I'll get somewhere. 
or I've got to find the guru, and then I'll get somewhere. This excessive thing that goes on, leading to the corruption of the gurus as well as the students, often, um, has to do with mixing that initiatory setting with the sort of day-to-day -day interaction. Like the Tibetans have a great proverb. They say, the best lama, the best guru, and lama translates guru, but it adds something to the translation. I'll come back to that. But the best lama or the best guru is one who lives at least three valleys away. <laughs> That's one of the things. And three valleys in Tibet is a big deal with a very high pass and a slow pony or yak or somebody or, or two-footed walking. It's not easy to get over to that three valleys. So you don't deal with the daily flaws and things about the lama, and you don't get involved in judging, is he enlightened or is she enlightened or not. You, you think of that one as your channel toward enlightenment, and then you work on yourself. And you don't have to, but then in these new, in the setting in the West where they come and they found a Dharma center, and there was somebody's the secretary, and somebody's the accountant, and somebody else, you know, like, like registers the Rolls Royces and whatever, you know, it can get really ridiculous, you know. <laughs> where then, the, then the, the yoga of seeing no flaw in the guru has to be imposed on a guru who daily is manifesting a lot of flaws and behaving badly, actually. And then it's supposed to be like, enlightened, so then everybody has to like keep saying no, 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 and then being, since we're all Americans, building up intense resentment, and then you have explosive events, right? Where they then turn hating, and also if one has had a bad guru, in other words, you learned something, you had some good time, you developed somewhat, and then the guy got out of hand and started really bothering people, and everybody turns on them and ejects them from the universe, and then hates them. That's really bad for you. You can dissociate yourself from a guru who has behaved badly and say, I no longer can go with you, and I'm not going like, to listen to you. You're no longer a good channel for me. But thank you for what you did channel when you were not, you and your misbehavior was not, what, was not interfering with your being a channel for there being some sort of enlightenment. So that way, then I can continue on the path. One doesn't turn against the whole thing, as often happens in these settings. So the guru thing is very, but my, what I love is I love the Tibetan translation of the word guru, which they did not translate with the Tibetan word for heavy. <laughs> they translated with lama. And lama means that which you can't get beyond. Doesn't mean that which is above you, higher than you. So I always like to say, the lama figure in the Tibetan should be really the model of a tar baby. <laughs> <laughs> rather than the model of something high above you that you're supposed to like cr grovel to. You know? In other words, it's something you can't get past. You know, you get stuck on. You know, like where you grab the tar baby. You know, and then you can't let go of it. That's a, the lama has that different connotation. You know, and also it's nice in that it relates to ama, mother. You know, lama, ma, mama. You know, it's very. It has, it has a nice. Tibetans did do these refinements because Tibet. Tibetans, for all their backwardness at the start, you know, being a conquest dynasty of, of really rough people, yak herding, wild people, you know. But the Siddhas all went up there, you know, the Maharajis of that time, and the, and the Lam Dalai Lamas and Shormabas and of that time, they all went up there ahead of time because they foresaw the Islamic events come here to India and the, and the vulnerability of India having become more gentle over a thousand years. And they, and they really worked them over. And then it became the mainstream thing. And they completely demilitarized. It took time, but they completely became vulnerable, as we've seen in this recent century. They got completely trampled, you know, totally. Which, which, which the original version of that was the Shakya kingdom of Shakyamuni. I don't know if you know that story, but so many of the young warriors in Shakyamuni's uh, city-state joined him and as mendicants and got into the thing that there was no one to defend the country. And they got completely wasted in his lifetime. Wow. So, so that is the, and that, that but, that, that don't be discouraged about that. The Buddhification, let's call it, not the Buddhist religionization, but the Buddhification of a culture which makes it more gentle and more vulnerable and more sensitive and makes life more pleasant for the people in this culture, and you know, now is something that all the cultures on the planet have to do or we won't survive. Because now nobody can conquer you, you know, basically. It's not possible. So anyway, okay, I'm sorry, that's just a footnote about Hinduism and Buddhism. Thank you. Okay, so 
you should, let's go now. We're going to do the first day. We started this, I read it to you, where you enter the mild deity reality between because naughty, naughty, you didn't recognize the mother reality of the objective clear light, the actual transparency of ultimate reality directly experienced beyond the subject-object dichotomy called mother because of her being the matrix of all possibility. So we missed that. We, we crawled beyond it. And now we, now we have a chance to get back to it through an icon. And so we meet the mild deities, which are depicted in that painting uh, behind him, one version of depiction of it from this, this tantra. And I read that to you before. Hey, noble one. So now, now, now think that you are either reading this to a person who has departed. They're already going. You're sitting next to the dead body. Or you yourself have left your body, and you're in a state, and you hear someone you're listening to read this, and you're trying to concentrate on it. You're mobilizing all the concentration power you developed in life to not get distracted by all the, the swirling, zooming, subtle dream world of the between. And you're listening to this. Okay, so that's it. Let's meditate this now. Hey, noble one, son or daughter, listen unwavering with intense concentration. There are six kinds of between. The natural life between, the dream between, the contemplation between, the death point between, the reality between, and the emergent existence between. I would explain those. Hey, noble one, three betweens will dawn for you. The death point between, the reality between, and the existence between will dawn. Until yesterday, in the death point between, the reality clear light dawned. But you did not recognize it, so you had to wander here. Now the reality between and the existence between will dawn for you. As I describe them, you must recognize them without fail. This is now, and then if you have done lucid dreaming, which there's been some talk about, then you, you will maybe be able to recognize yourself in the dreamlike state of the between. The dream state that we get into every night is an immensely valuable arena of learning if you really take the focus to do that. And uh, we should really have more retreats on that. Hey, noble one, now you have arrived at what is called death. You are going from this world to the world beyond. You are not alone. It happens to everyone. You must not indulge in attachment and insistence on this life. Though you are attached and you insist, you have no power to stay. You will not avoid wandering in the life cycle. Do not lust. Do not cling. Be mindful of the three jewels, the teacher, the teaching, and the reality taught, and the community of those implementing the teaching. Hey, noble child, whatever terrifying visions of the reality between may dawn upon you, you should not forget the following words. You must proceed remembering in your mind the meaning of these words. Therein lies the key of recognition. Hey, now when the reality between, between dawns upon me, I will let go of the hallucinations of instinctive terror. Enter the recognition of all objects as my mind's own vision, and understand this as the pattern of perception in the between. Come to this moment, arrived at this most critical cessation. I will not fear my own visions of deities, mild and fierce. You should proceed clearly, saying this verse aloud and remembering its meaning. Do not forget this as it is the key to recognizing whatever terrifying visions dawn as certainly being your own perceptions. Hey, noble one, at this time when your mind and body are parting ways, pure reality manifests in subtle, dazzling visions, vividly experienced, naturally frightening and worrisome, shimmering like a mirage on the plains in autumn. Do not fear them. Do not be terrified. Do not panic. You have what is called an instinctual mental body. 
not a material flesh and blood body. Thus, whatever sounds, lights, and rays may come at you, they cannot hurt you. You cannot die. It is just enough for you to recognize them as your own perception. Understand that this is the between. Hey, noble one, if you don't recognize them as your own perceptions in this way, whatever other meditations and achievements you may have experienced in the human world, if you did not meet this particular instruction, the lights will frighten you, the sounds will panic you, the rays will terrify you. If you don't know the key of this instruction, you will not recognize the sounds, lights, and rays and you will wander in the life cycle. Hey, noble one. Having fainted for four and a half days, that's in the clear light, but possibly in the case of some only experienced or remembered as a, and recognized as a state of unconsciousness. Having fainted for four and a half days, you are now proceeding. You have woken up with the worry, what is happening to me? Recognize that you are in the between. Now, since the life cycle is in suspension, all things dawn as lights and deities. All space dawns full of azure light. Now from the central Buddha land, the all-pervading drop, the Lord Vairochana appears before you, white-bodied, sitting on a lion throne, holding in his hand an eight-spoked wheel, united with his consort Akasha Data Ishvari. That's the central figure in that painting, that white one. Akasha Data Ishvari means the queen of the realm of space. The natural purity of the consciousness aggregate, that is your heap of cognitions. The blue light of the reality perfection wisdom, a clear and vivid color blue, frighteningly intense, shines piercingly from the heart center of this Vairochana couple dazzling your eyes to an unbearable degree. Simultaneously, the soft white light of the gods shines upon you and penetrates you in parallel with the bright blue light. At that time, influenced by negative evolutionary momentum, you panic and are terrified of that bright blue light of reality, perfection, wisdom and you flee from it. And you feel a liking for the soft white light of the gods and you approach it. But you must not panic at that blue light, the clear, piercing, brilliant, frightening, supreme wisdom clear light. Do not fear it. It is the light ray of the transcendent Lord, the reality perfection wisdom. Feel attracted to it with faith and reverence. Make it the answer to your prayer, thinking. It is the light ray of the compassion of Lord Vairochana. I must take refuge in it. It is the way Lord Vairochana comes to escort you through the straits of the between. It is the light ray of the compassion of Vairochana. Don't be enticed by the soft white light of the gods. Don't be attached to it. Don't long for it. If you do cling to it, you will wander into the realm of the gods and you will continue to cycle through the six realms of driven existence. It is an obstacle to cessation, the path of freedom. So don't look upon it but be devoted to the brilliant, penetrating blue light. Aim your intense willpower toward Vairochana and repeat after me, 
the following prayer. Why don't you repeat like you're a ghost? When I roam the life cycle. When I roam the life cycle. Driven by strong delusions. Driven by strong delusions. May the Lord Vairochana. May the Lord Vairochana. Lead me on the path. Lead me on the path. Of the clear light. Of the clear light. Of reality, perfection, wisdom. Of reality, perfection, wisdom. May his consort Buddha. May his consort Buddha. Dhatishwari. Dhatishwari. Back me on the way. Back me on the way. Deliver me from the dangerous. Deliver me from the dangerous. Straits of the between. Straits of the between. And carry me. And carry me. To perfect Buddhahood. To perfect Buddhahood. Thus praying with fierce devotion, you dissolve in rainbow light into the heart of the Vairochana couple, whence you will enter the central pure land, Ganavyuha, dense array, and become a Buddha by way of the body of perfect beatitude. <laughs> so that's called the first day. And therefore, that, from that comes the general advice, which could be used by the living, dying people. Like, whatever happens to you, always go to the strobe light, go to the bright light, never go to the seemingly in the seductive light. Go to the one that wipes you out. And give yourself over to it, type of thing. Always the safest way. And then, there are five other days which we won't read, we won't meditate, although maybe another time we could do more of this. It's kind of very funny, very interesting. And uh, dealing with Akshobhya and, and Amitabha and Amoga Siddhi. And these are these celestial Buddhas who, who are mounted on the five wisdoms, what are called the five, or rather I like to call them the five intuitions or intuitive wisdoms, which actually are the five addictive emotions and notions converted into these five intuitive wisdoms, which is the role, which is the job of Tantra, but which is difficult. But maybe we'll do this, the Vajrasattva one, which is the, which is the sixth day, because it says something very beautiful in it which we, you, I think if you meditate, you'll get the, you'll get the, and I'll skip some of it. Okay, hey, noble one, okay, back to meditating now. Could you stretch a little in between? I hope. Okay, now back to meditating. Hey, no, this is the sixth day. The other ones are different colors, you know. And each brilliant color, you know, white, yellow, green, etc., goes along with a soft color, luring you to the animal realm, the human realm, the preta realm, the Hell, the hell realm, the, the one connected with hatred, transmutation of hatred will lead to the hell realm, etc. And uh, the, the titan realm, jealousy leads you there. But the stage have a seductive light coming next to the brilliant light. And each time you have a chance to go through the heart of that Buddha couple, uh, you know, in the, which, which is very interesting. It's very parallel to how the uh, science of the between state describes when you, if you go back into a mammal or human realm, how you go into the couple of your parent in the same way. In other words, you are this, this wandering dream being and you enter into the, into the heart of the parents and then end up in the womb of the mother, you know, and that way become conceived. So the conception involves the meeting of three seeds Three genes, not just two, but three. Okay, anyway, back to sixth day. Hey, noble one, back to meditate. Listen without wavering. Up until yesterday, the visions of the five Buddha clans appeared to you one by one. Though they were clearly described under the influence of negative evolutionary momentum, you were panicked and still up to now you are left behind here. If you had already recognized the natural shining of one of the wisdoms of the five clans as your own visions, 
it would have caused you to dissolve into rainbow light in the body of one of the five Buddha clans and to attain Buddhahood in the body of Beatitudes. As it is, you did not recognize the light and you are still wandering here. Now, behold without distraction. Now, the vision of all the five clans and the vision of the joining of the four wisdoms have come to escort you in their direction. Recognize them. Hey, noble child, the purity of the four elements is dawning as the four lights. In the center, the Vairochana Buddha couple, as described above, appears from the Pure Land all pervading drop. In the east, the Vajrasattva Buddha couple. In the south, the Ratasambhava Buddha couple. In the west, the Amitabha Buddha couple. In the north, the Amogasiddhi Buddha couple. And then he lists some other protectors and other beings in each of the five clans, which we can skip. Hey, noble one, <clears throat> those pure lands are not anywhere else. They abide in your own heart within its center and four directions. They now emerge from out of your heart and appear to you as if external realities. Those images do not come from anywhere else. They are primordially created as the natural manifestation of your own awareness. So you should know how to recognize them. Hey, noble one, those deities, not great, not small, symmetrical, each with ornamentation, color, posture, throne, and gesture, those deities, each pervaded by five mantras, each of the five circled by a five-colored rainbow aura, with male bodhisattvas of each clan upholding the male part and female bodhisattvas of each clan upholding the female part, with all the mandalas arising simultaneously whole. They are your archetype deities, so you should recognize them. Hey, noble one. From the hearts of those five Buddha clan couples, four combined wisdom light rays dawn in your heart center, each extremely subtle and clear, like sun rays woven together in a rope. Now first from Vairochana's heart center, a cloth of the frighteningly brilliant white light rays of the reality perfection wisdom dawns connecting to your heart center. Within that light ray cloth, white drops glisten with their rays like mirrors facing toward you, very clear, brilliant, and awesomely penetrating, with each drop itself naturally adorned with five other drops. <laughs> Thus, that light ray cloth is adorned with shining drops and droplets without limit or center. From the heart of Vajrasattva, the mirror wisdom, a cloth of blue light rays, shines brilliantly upon you, connecting to your heart center, on which shining blue drops like turquoise bowls facing down toward you, adorned by other drops and droplets, all shine upon you. From the heart of Ratnasambhava, a cloth of the equalizing wisdom, yellow light rays, shines brilliantly upon you, on which golden drops, like golden bowls, adorned by other golden drops and droplets, face down and dawn upon you. From the heart center of Amitabha, the discriminating wisdom, red light cloth, shines brilliantly upon you, on which radiant red drops, like coral bowls, facing down to you, endowed with the deep luster of wisdom, very bright and penetrating, each adorned by five natural red drops. All these shine upon you, adorned by drops and droplets without center or limit. These also shine upon you, connecting to your heart center. Hey, noble one, these all arise from the natural exercise of your own awareness. They do not come from anywhere else. So do not be attached to them and do not be terrified of them. Relax in the experience of non-conceptualization. 
Within that experience, all the deities and light rays will dissolve into you and you will become a Buddha. Hey, noble one, since the exercise of the wisdom of your awareness is not perfected, the all-accomplishing wisdom's green light does not shine. Emerald light. Hey, noble one, these are called the vision of the four wisdoms in combination, the inner passageway of Vajrasattva. That means the diamond hero. At that time, you should remember the orientation previously given by your spiritual teacher. If you remember that orientation, you will trust those visions. You will recognize reality like the child meeting the mother or like the greeting of a long familiar person and you will cease all reifying notions. Recognizing your visions as your own creations, you will trust your being held on the changeless path of pure reality, and you will achieve the samadhi of continuity. Your awareness will dissolve into the body of great effortlessness, and you will become a Buddha in the beatific body, never to be reversed. Hey, noble one, along with the wisdom lights, but before I do that, just reflect now on this twisted rainbow of rainbow rope, like a, what, like a, yet it's like a cloth, path of cloth, and yet it's woven into a rope-like cloth connecting from your actual heart center of your utmost identity into the mandalic hearts of all of those four Buddhas. So that it's not a matter of you having to recognize and go into the heart of like Vairochana or some deity seen as an object in front of you. But rather it's automatically, you're totally connected to all of their heart centers, to all this vivid, dazzling white, blue, red, and yellow, golden, shining, sort of liquid, laser, light drop, cloth-like rays. And they therefore effortlessly pull you, your entire being, into merging into the mandala in, and becoming one with those divine beings and becoming such a divine being yourself. It's like the Buddhas couldn't invite you into their hearts and their pure lands to become a Buddha in the previous five days. So now they offer to you this lifeline. They throw to you this lifeline, which connects to the center of you. So in a way, there's almost no need to choose to connect to it. It's close to being automatically pulled in by it like a tractor beam, like this brilliant rainbow tractor beam going right to your own heart center, <laughs> really. Uh, hey, noble one, but then there's a warning. Hey, noble one, along with the wisdom lights, there also arise the impure, misleading visions of the six species, namely the soft white light of the gods, the soft red light of the titans, the soft blue light of the humans, the soft green light of the animals, the soft yellow light of the pretans, and the soft smoky light of the hells. These six arise entwined in parallel with the pure wisdom lights. They're like, like a sort of aura around them of more seductive, easy to look at things, not dazzling. Therefore, don't seize or cling to any of those lights. Relax in the experience of non-perception. If you fear the wisdom lights and cling to the impure six species life cycle lights, you will assume the body of a being of one of the six species. You will not reach the time of liberation from the great ocean of suffering of the life cycle. You will experience only trouble. Hey, noble one, if you lack the orientation given in the instruction of the spiritual teacher, and you fear and are terrified by the above images and the pure, dazzling wisdom lights, you will come to cling to the impure life cycle lights. Do not do so. Have faith in those dazzling, piercing, pure wisdom lights. Trust in them, thinking, 
These light rays of the wisdom of the compassion of the blissful lords of the five clans have come to me to hold me with compassion. I must take refuge in them. Not clinging, not longing for the misleading lights of the six species, you aim your will one-pointedly toward the five Buddha clan couples and make the following prayer. Hey, when I roam the life cycle driven by the five strong poisons, May the Lord victors of the five clans lead me on the path of the clear light of the four wisdoms in combination. May the supreme five consort Buddhas back me on the way and deliver me from the impure lights of the six realms. Delivering me from the dangerous straits of the between, may they carry me to the five supreme Buddha lands. Then on the seventh day, there are these scientist deities. And my Tibetan translator colleague really freaked about my translation of Vidyadara, a scientist, which literally means holder of science. So they really freaked because these guys have long matted locks. They're wearing like jock straps. <laughs> they have like bone ornaments. And they're like, they're like scientists in downtime, <laughs> back in Berkeley, <laughs> in their garden. <laughs> they're not wearing a white coat in the lab and stuff. So they get, scientists all wear white coats and they have mirrors on not, their head and they're in the lab. And you can't say these are scientists. Not in California. So, so it's really, you know, so that's why, you see, I wanted to have, thank you, you know, that is, that is stretch. I wanted so much to get, you know, ILM, when George Lucas still owned it, I begged him. I, I happened to have a great acquaintance, and I begged and begged, and he was, didn't get what I was wanting. I had, uh, uh, you know, to make really vivid, dazzling light ray, you know, videos. You know, they think they can do it with incredible colors on these things, you know. And then, you know, play them. And they, they don't have to have this kind of deity. They can have Jesus or Mother Mary holding a baby. They can have whatever people. You have different varieties for different people from different cultural backgrounds. And uh, the Mexicans would sort of like the skeleton thing. They have these Day of the Dead. They have really great you know, vision, you know, like imagery. But other people would have different things. And then you have 20 minutes in a can, in a DVD. You play on a projector in a hospice for people and just, you know, like this is kind of fun, go and see this like a roller coaster, you go check it out and then people get into it and they watch it, it's very vivid, very powerful and then you have the, 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 around the screen, you know, you have the soft lights, you know, and then you say like, try to go, try to focus as much as you can on the center and then whoosh, it goes by them, you know. And this would be awesome subliminal perceptual training for people for their tunnel or their whatever it is, you know, it really, you know, it, it, seriously. Yeah, I know. N now living, that living, dying, you can get it. Then you, then you can, let's see, you can market that. Then you'll be out of the market once everybody can just play it. But you know, it'll be a good market for a while. But now they even have the virtual reality where it's not just on the screen, exactly. but you're, but, but oh, you're, exactly. but you're in it. Yes, that's <laughs> it. Google let's, better, maybe I, I Let's go into business. I didn't, yeah, we will. Let's, I, I talked to Google, and they, but they don't listen to religion professors. They don't listen to professors. But, did you talk but, to uh, Danny, but you know, yeah. Did you talk to Danny Goleman what? about, did you talk to Danny Goleman? Uh, no. Because he's a good yeah, friend, he of, would, he's he a good friend good, of George he's a good Lucas. Marketer, actually. He's a good friend of George Lucas. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah, I, well, that's no, why. I, I haven't talked to him about it. Okay. But yeah, he would be good. So then maybe I thought one last thing. Then, the, But one of the things about the Book of the Dead that's very discouraging when you read it is then at the end of each section, it's like, well, now you blew it. You didn't recognize. And, you know, so now it's the next round. But, but you've got another chance. What? You've got and another chance. And then we give you another chance. That's right. And so uh, I just think we should do one fierce one just so you see. And the reason that the fierce ones then start on the eighth day the fierce deity, and I never like peaceful and wrathful, because the, I call them mild and fierce, because none of them are wrathful. They're all perfectly blissful and happy, but they manifest ferocity, you know? They're like, they're like show ferocity to, because they have to pluck you from an area that's more dangerous, you know? 
So they appeal to the being in the between subliminally who's getting in a more dangerous thing and they're more, and they've frightened away things that are trying to take over the being at this further level. So let's just do one more short meditation and, and, uh, and just, just, just to get familiar with it. And actually Christianity and Judaism, I don't know if Islam ever did, but probably some Sufis could tell you. But they used to have you know, what they call cherubim and seraphim very ferocious looking angels. They did not all have a bunch of cute, cutesy wootsies, you know, with like John Travolta with wing, feathery wings and like a <laughs> hairdo and a white gown. You know. Oh, that was a good They movie. did not have angels like that. They had ferocious angels with six wings. Francis, you know, Francis of Assisi was enfolded in the six wings of a very fierce looking, sort of, you know, like high agree about type angel with fangs and like really ferocious. And so they, they, the Desert Fathers saw that because these are dealing, when they're going deeper into your unconscious, they're dealing with your Thanatos imagery, you know, not just your Eros imagery like the mild ones are. Okay, so do one more short one. Hey. You know, I never break, by the way, in, in my home studio. I'm terrible. I don't have breaks. I proclaim the, uh, the sessions free pee zones. So that means you can get up and go to the bathroom any time. Oh, it's not like EST where you can't pee for a whole day? No, no, you can get, anybody can leave and pee. It's not, we're not in church. <laughs> Should I turn my but microphone off? I forgot off? to mention ahead of time, it's always a free pee zone. <laughs> so you can pee at will. Oh, well, yeah. when you were doing this, you kind of also make that thing rumble. I know, and that's what I would. Don't do that. Yes, dear. <laughs> that's the thunder of the, thunder of the between state. But I'll try not to. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Hey, noble one, listen without wavering. The peaceful between already dawned, but you did not recognize the light. So now you still must wander here. Now on this eighth day, the Heruka, fierce deity, I think it's really sort of ancient, super primordial. It's a Hercules connects to that word, Greek word. The Heruka, fierce deity host, will arise. Do not waver. Recognize them. Hey, noble one, the great, glorious Buddha Heruka appears, wine maroon in color, with three faces, six arms, and four legs stretched out, his front face maroon, his right face white, his left face red, his entire body blazing with light rays. His eyes glare, fiercely terrifying. His eyebrows flash like lightning. His fangs gleam like new copper. He roars with laughter, ah la la, and ha ha ha. <coughs> he makes loud hissing noises like shoo shoo. His bright orange hair blazes upward adorned with skull crown and sun and moon disks. His body is adorned with black snakes and a freshly severed head garland. His first right hand holds a wheel, the middle an ax, and the third a sword. His first left hand holds a bell, the middle a plowshare, and the third a skull bowl. His consort Buddha Krodishvari, meaning the queen of the ferocious ones, enfolds his body her right arm embracing his neck, her left hand offering him sips of blood, demon blood from her skull bowl. She duck clucks her tongue menacingly and roars just like thunder. Both are ablaze with wisdom flames, shooting out from their blazing Vajra hairs. They stand in the warrior's posture on a throne supported by eagles. They arise, thus they arise manifestly before you having emerged from within your own brain. Do not fear them. Do not be terrified. Do not hate them. Recognize them as an image of your own awareness. He is your own archetype deity, so do not panic. In fact, they are really Lord Vairochana, father and mother, so do not be afraid. The very moment you recognize them, you will be liberated. So that's the fierce one. Okay. And we did, we jumped already to the thing about the describing of yourself. So we really covered most of it. 
Ava. Well, these fear fear groups, I know there are many of them. I know that. I'm sorry. I absolutely can't hear you. And I know you're going to talk about some dreams, and I don't know why Dustin did, deprived us of this. Hello, hello. Mm, no, I, it won't work unless it's turned on from there. Unless it's turned on from that side. So, okay, please. So there are many fear fear groups in the Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. Yamantaka and sure, Lhasa sure. Buddhism and so forth. Could any one of those appear in Sikhism? Yeah, yeah, it would depend upon. You know, these have come from the particular mandala. That's the fierce deity right there, that one on the right the main one that was just described, uh, with wings and so on. And uh, that comes from the Guhyagarbha Mandala. And uh, these, these archetypes are developed by yogis and yoginis from ancient, from thousands of years, working on this. And they are just models, you know. They're, they're templates that different people choose to associate with. And uh, actually, the Tibetans have a saying that they don't like to repeat with all of their initiating. But they say in India, they have one initiation and many attainments. In Tibet, they have many attainments and no, many initiations and no attainments. <laughs> 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 they do, and the Lamas have such a saying. And so any one of them will do, but people are drawn with a particular affinity to the different ones because these are sort of templates of eros and thanatos energies of the unconscious. You know, there's like, they are like you know when you do a spacewalk from a from a uh, space station, you know, you put on that Michelin Man suit, you know, uh, to go out there, pressurized suit, right, and you look like Michelin Man. So when you go into your unconscious, there's different kinds of pressurized suits, and you put that on as a body, in tantra, and uh, and therefore, in a way. Uh, an ordinary person in Tibet will only have seen these as paintings on walls in, in temples. And then they may have a chance of associating with it. But uh, only a yogi who has really meditated the mandala of this Kuhyagarbha, for example, would find these deities so particularly compelling. You know? And um, if you've spent a lot of time doing Yamantaka, using Yamantaka as your template, for as a way of designing your inner sensitivity, you follow me, and it's so sophisticated and such it's such an advanced neuroscientific uh, thing. For example, something like Yamantaka, which you mentioned, so I assume you know something about that. If you have so many arms and so many faces, then and you, and tantra does literally mean a level of where someone has done the no eye, no ear, no nose, no body, no mind, blah, 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 business, no attainment, no non-attainment, so has created a foundation in the clear light of the emptiness awareness, and even matter being emptiness, that they, they're med meditationally, they can go and interfere in the brain with the model that we now carry in our brains, all of us, which it enables our motor energies to go and move our muscles and lose, use our two legs and two arms, and one face, and, and two eyes, and two ears, etc. And that's what we have a model of ourselves in the brain, actually, that, that you know, phantom limb phenomenon and such things prove that. And this, this kind of meditation goes and actually interferes with that. And then you go in a certain session of that kind of tantric practice of one of these archetype deities, and you remodel your image of yourself in the brain, where you have all this, you have shoulder joint that expands into 34 arms, which must be one weird feeling shoulder joint. <laughs> Compared to I have just one, you know, like hospital for special surgery. I have, you know, I get like rotator cuff surgery and that's the one thing. Imagine having to have rotator cuff surgery for 34 arms. It would really be quite complicated, I think. They have to have laser guided, whatever. Think anyway, about, yeah. point is, in your own mind, you can do that if you have such a stability of meditative thing. And the point of doing that is, then that opens neural pathways deep in the center, in the what they call it chakras, but that opens the inner chakras for eventual out of body and in and out of body type of things, rehearsing death experience and so forth. And those are the psychonauts. That's a psychonaut training, so it's highly advanced. So when you meet them in the ordinary person dying, it is really, it could be what one has an affinity for, 
It could awaken something in someone. Some might have spent a life, someone might have spent a lifetime not really doing any practices because of some circumstance, but they maybe did a lot of them in previous lives, and then they might connect to something, but it's kind of, it's kind of a, you know, it's a crapshoot for an ordinary person. But it's still considered worthwhile trying and doing. And, uh, and then sometimes it's just a matter of meeting, you know, someone might meet Jesus. And, you know, they're not, they're not meditating. They're discouraged from meditating themselves as Jesus, except in the old days, some very advanced yogis in the Christian monasteries, they did, you know, the Imitatio Christi and that, that one, that English one by, is that Thomas Akempis or somebody? Where you imitate the Christ, you know, yes, yes. and you be Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's like a kind of archetype you're doing, you know what I mean? But it's, uh, and they might have had esoteric things of different angels and Gabriel, Michael, seraphs and cherubs, but probably not. And, Are, uh, but to some extent they may have. Are there reports from other traditions of what people see, like in a shamanic tradition or a, another tradition that instead of the Haruka or the, the, the other things that we've been there, talking there about? Are, there are. There are. They meet, to, you know, the, the, the shamanic ones, it's, they might very much connect to the animal world, you know, and they meet the bear totem and this and that. They have like a special protective connection to the animal world. But uh, and away from Tibetan world, that might be a bit dangerous. The sense of rebirth in the animal form might be a little worrisome for the ordinary person again. But yeah, there are, sure there are. Why not? I mean, in the near-death experiences, where people meet guides that are sort of like some sort of person that they recognize. Right. Ever since Star Wars, I bet a lot of people meet Yoda. <laughs> they do. But actually, Yoda's face is modeled on a Tibetan Lama, one of the tutors of the Dalai Lama, called Sergon Rinpoche. It was Nina's favorite. It actually is modeled on that. They actually, the guy, the artist, went to Dharamsala and met that guy. <laughs> I had this, he has this strange thing about the upper end of the central channel in the yogic neurology is in the forehead here where the third eye is on certain deities. And he had this strange thing where he, it's like a tick, where his, there would be like a, it would swirl like a little, like it wasn't an ordinary muscle or thing, but it would, it would like be a little swirl in this forehead where it would be like you'd see there was some kind of energy thing that would go like this, the skin would swirl. Does Yoda do that? What? Does Yoda do that? Yeah, yeah he oh, does. Okay. And he had the thing when his, my, his brow goes like that. Do, don't think. <laughs> what, yes? Other traditions that are said to have killed a guy by Bingling and then her. I'm sorry? Killed a guy by Bingling. Yeah. It, well, just her experience of that sense yes. of revelation and sure. fiery. You know, there were great people. You know, the, the only difference between the West and India was that India was a less authoritarian society. So more people who had their inner visions, their visions were recorded, used, and kept. Whereas the rare person, like even Teresa of Avila, if you know her history, she had to go flagellate herself in between visions where she would be in union, ecstatic union with Christ, just to make sure it wasn't Satan. So she would have to go and whip herself. And while she was having her vision down the street in a stadium, they were having auto da fe's and burning people by the hundreds at stakes. You know. And probably many of the people they burn and things, they were, have, they were probably getting pretty turned on too in the morphic resonance of her, but the, the society wouldn't tolerate it. You know, it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't allow people to have more personal energy and feel better, more streaming within themselves because they were more afflicted with what our, my beloved Wilhelm Reich called the emotional plague, you know, which is the dampening down of your own like, inner feelings, you know, your inner meltings. You know with militaristic postures, you know. He was so brilliant. Did you ever read that book? I read the some of his The Emotional Plague book. and the Murder of Christ? Yeah, I did. I ah! Did long ago. Long That's ago. The awesome. Murder. Yeah. He was, what? They killed him, didn't they? Uh, yeah, well, the FDA finally got him. But yeah. Hitler and Lenin didn't <laughs> quite get him, but they did suppress but, his work. But, but the Americans got but him. But the Americans finally got him, yeah. The FDA chased him down up in Maine. Orgon <laughs> box. What? The Orgon box. Yeah, he was at Organon in Maine. And uh, my motorcycle group, we went up there from Cambridge. Yeah. But we didn't find him. Paul, do you know about he was the, dead. Um, what? It's St. Catherine. I, I'm not sure, but St. Catherine of Siena, that she had the capacity to work with people to transcend their death. And there's this very vivid um, story about her where I, they were executing a lot of maybe Christians, I'm not sure, but a lot of people were being executed. I forget which century it was. And there was a young man who was going to his execution, and she was 
working with him, and he said, you know, I mean, he's very young, like maybe 21, and he was being executed, maybe by the political regime, I guess. Of course. And, and she said she would go with him to the execution. It was, his head was going to be cut off. And so he said to her, if you are there with me, then I will have no fear of this happening. And so there's this incredible story in the book, St. Sarah, um, where she stood before him and he looked in her eyes and she agreed to like touch his head when it was severed. Oh, wow. And she re recorded that, I mean, she couldn't write because women couldn't write, you know, they couldn't, Julian of Norwich wrote, but that was, Okay, okay. Called Julian. Footnote, footnote. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right. He caught so the she, head. So she had recorded orally. She said, um, he looked into her eyes, and uh, she had a look of bliss. Like, he ha had no fear of the executioner's axe. Yes. And then she caught his bloody, severed head. And she later was sainted. That's but very cool. But there are Christian traditions, though. Oh, sure. You know, where that yes, yes. happened, not just the jewelry. Just the thing about India is that they were just, where you would have a few individuals like that, they would have thousands <coughs> doing this. Because the society was more tolerant. Because uh -huh. they were wealthy. As I say, it was the California uh -huh. of ancient Eurasia. Yes, what's, what are you agitated about? You worried about that guy getting decapitated? <laughs> what? Something going wrong? Yes, oh yes. Could you say anything briefly about dream yoga? What's that? Could you say anything briefly about dream yoga? Yeah, sure. So dream, dream yoga is like bardo yoga, you know? It's a use of being conscious of your more subtle self. And, um, you know, it's like the Matrix, you know? That's why I love the movie The Matrix. You write The Matrix, when he first goes in The Matrix with Morpheus, after he, they've done all the acupuncture and the surgery of all the holes in his body and everything in the submarine. And then he goes in and has his first training session with Morpheus. If so, some of you may not have seen The Matrix, you're looking blank, but I'm sure most of you, I hope, have, at least the first one. And then the first training session, he comes in there, and he and Morpheus, are, Morpheus has his usual coat, his shades, and he has his little leather jacket, you know, and Neo does. And, he works, and then he says to Morpheus, well, if this is just a computer simulation, what is this? You know, like this. And Morpheus says, it's a digital residual self-image. No, oh, totally cool. So that's what you have in a dream. You are having a digital, well, never mind about digital, but it is kind of digital, but you're having a residual self-image that the subtle energy, which is similar to the subtle energy of the, of the clear light, actually, but it's subtle energy, like, enfolded there, of the subtle loom, you know. It isn't coarse wind, but subtle wind. And uh, that's, the, that, that's your body, and your, your, your you know, they would they always say, like, with what eyes do you have visions in a dream? What are the eyes that are seeing that? What are the ears that are seeing that? You know, the hearing and sound, or tasting something, or touching something, as, which is more rare in a dream. You're also always visual, but the other things, the other senses do function. And so the idea of being, of course, the Western psychiatry thinks that you're just supposed to be dreaming, because then you're unguarded. And then the images will come up from your memory and from your unconscious, and you'll, know, you'll be able to recite those, to remember them and recite those to the shrink, and then you'll get feel better, but, which is good, too. But the lucid dreaming thing is where you train yourself and um, just read Stephen LaBerge's book, or there are a number of such books, <coughs> and, uh, and, you, and try and start doing it, you know? Like, you know, you keep a journal, put, write it down in the morning, Think about that night as the last thing before you go to sleep. And actually, in Tibetan tradition, if you do have an initiation, where let's say, let's say white Tara, something really blissfully peaceful, gentle, and easygoing, say white Tara, the healing white Tara, you you then imagine as you're you you imagine as you're falling asleep and you're nuzzling into your pillow. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, you have a nice soft pillow, and you imagine that you're head is placing itself in the lap of Tara. And that <coughs> the enlightened female Buddha Tara is going to sort of guard you, travel with you in the dream state, and protect you from any sort of in, in, you know, invasion or you know, a bad, bad message or anything in the dream state. 
And um, because if you become conscious in the dream state, then you start, you can connect to other beings' dreams, actually, they say. Like Charles Tart has a marvelous work, the psychologist California against psychologist Charles Tart. He trains some of his cli patients, couples, to be, to be lucid dream and then meet each other in the lucid dream in the dream form. He has some experiments that were successful like that. He had some yogi clients who became yogis working with him. At least he recounts that, you know. And uh, very amazing, actually, that some of those books, later books that he wrote, Charles Tart. I don't even know where he is. Is he still around there? Do you know? I haven't heard of him for, heard for, for at least a decade. Anyway, he, T A R T. You know, and he, he uh, and, but anyway, the point is, it's a great training of that you can learn a great deal. And you can even, being conscious that you're dreaming without waking from the dream, you can even more, you can accelerate a psychotherapeutic thing of like looking for traumas in your unconscious for memory, you know. And then maybe the Riken thing of connecting trauma in your history, in your mind, to certain structures in your body where you have like emotional plague, you know, like uh, things where your thing is backed off. You know, the great um, former hospital for special surgery um, spinal surgeon, Dr. John Sarno, got tired of doing spinal surgery for people. You know, the cutting open of the vertebrae when the passage narrowed up to stenosis. And because he decided it was mainly where the lower back is where <coughs> uh, traumas are encoded in the musculature and then there are tensions there, you know, because people, that's sort of your back, you know, when people oppress you or something and you, you scrunch your back. And then the, he calls it tension myositis syndrome where the back becomes all tensed, the muscles do, and they cut off blood flow to the bone and the marrow of the vertebraic bone and then th that's why they swell and become inflamed and then pinch the nerve because they're not getting enough blood flow because the muscles are blocking it. And then he, he practically became a shrink. He stopped doing surgery. And he said that the surgery was like placebo effect. You know, it's like, yes, it would temporarily, but then it would come back because the muscle was still. And that's a brilliant thing. that They happened from the material side. They got to where the mind was key. You know, He has great books, Healing Back Pain, in case anybody has any. Yeah, that's, I've, I've Healing that. Back Pain, John Sarno. Right. I know one guy who had terrible back problems. He had operations and all kinds of things and would help for a while and not. And then he just read that book. <laughs> he, just, he remembered something from his childhood and he never had a back pain again. Right. <laughs> Somehow he worked on his back. So. So, um, so, so in, you can, in other words, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to digress there, it's just my age, but, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 in the illicit dreaming, then one could go in and discover those kind of things that you do discover on the couch of the psychiatrist anyway, after a much longer time, and find it more quickly. And because you could still allow even lucidly dreaming spontaneous things to happen with your unconscious and so forth. And then, but remember the difference about the unconscious between the Buddhist psychiatrist and the Western psychiatrist, modern psychiatrist, is that the Buddhist psychiatrist doesn't tolerate an unconscious. <clears throat> he feels that the purpose of our human life is to become conscious of our unconscious and to gain conscious ability to modify impulses of the unconscious. And of course, that's finally what Tantra really is. It's finding the deepest eros, the deepest lust, you know, polymorphic, what Freud called polymorphous perversity, the deepest hatred, the murderousness, you know, of the thanatos and the eros, and the deepest murderous hatred of the Oedipal, Electra complex, et cetera, jealousies and whatever it is, and those energies, and then turn them into wisdom, and the five Buddha intuitions, you know. But that's why it's esoteric, because if someone goes and says, oh, I'm gonna now use my lust, to be creative and be a tantric yogi, but they've never really developed any level of detachment from their lust, they're gonna be a tantric yogi of the kind that, you know, Playboy Mansion tantric yogi, and they're gonna be a complete pain in the neck, or pain everywhere, you know, lots of other kinds of pains, you know, because they're gonna not really have opened their own inner sensitivities right. anyway, and they're just gonna be finding an excuse for ordinary, you know, self-indulgence, and get into all kind of weird kinky things. So that's why it's considered dangerous, Tantra, and why it's considered esoteric. It isn't esoteric because they're hiding something or withholding something from something great from the general population. 
it's considered esoteric because if the general population takes their ordinary unconscious drives of lust, hatred, pride, jealousy, envy, delusion, uh, and says, I'm going to now use these to do all kind of great things, then they're just going to go nuts, right, in, in the back seat of their Rolls Royces. <laughs> they're going to do stuff. Or in Marin County. It's not going to be enlightening. So, so, uh, so anyway, so that's something about lucid dreaming. But therefore, lucid, and therefore, lucid dreaming, again, you know, Tart's things are amazing, and some of these people have done it without the benefit of Buddhism. They can do these things. And some people naturally lucid dream. Because, of course, people were yogis in previous lives. And, and, um, but in a way, ordinary person doing lucid dreaming, they should do it in a context where they have a motivation. And that's because, actually, you can get too much in your dream world. And then you, know, you can um, deal with, get, get problems. Uh, the Tibetan medical people, for example, in Tibetan medicine thing, they get, have a manual of when do you refer someone to an exorcist? And sometimes someone, you have a good diagnosis of their problem, and you give them the right medicine, and they take the right nutrition, and do the right therapy, but it doesn't do any good. Then you say, oh, OK. And then you do a special demon urine and demon pulse, special examination of them. And, oh, and you say, then you refer them to some, some other scientist with a weird hairdo, <laughs> who's the exorcist. <laughs> and then you get rid of it. And, and especially, I think, our Western <laughs> hospitals are sites of spirits who are very negative, and they get people in weakened state, and they do. There's a lot of. It's not only bacteria in there. You know, antibiotic-resistant bacteria in there bothering people. There are entities in there bothering people, definitely. And I know doc, I take them to bed in doctors' hospital, and they're like, "Oh boy, this place needs a cleansing." And actually, in California, there are some nice shamans who do that. Really? They have like it's like a Ghostbusters group. They get out there and they cleanse this and that hospital, and then suddenly there are better results. How do you find these people? Huh? I have the phone numbers. Okay. Uh, I'll give you I, one of them. I mean, there are others, I think, but then, then she would probably know others, but I know one. And I, I'm, I think it works, and I think it should happen, actually. They should do that, but of course, our materialist guys will never do it. I went over, I gave a lecture at Sloan Kettering the other day, not too, a few weeks back. You know, the, the, the supreme bastion where a lot of the Rockefeller brother money went. You know, in the, you know, the different brothers as they were croaking, they, they only had a lot of money to maybe prolong their lives by a few whatever, a few, few things, a few stock returns. <coughs> and uh, and uh, it has a really, there, there are some entities around there. Definitely. I mean, I'm not as sensitive, but that place is like a fortress of something. So could somebody like these two doctors who work at a hospital in Baltimore? Yeah. Is well, there we something send them that they a shaman can, or an No, but is there something they can do without calling the shaman? Well, Some, no, but, but it's like your thing. They need to go maybe have a little training by one of those shamans who's, who's sort of aware of that, you know. And then there are Tibetan shamans like that who do that, but they, but they I don't know, they don't necessarily do it. I had one, I, I took one lama once uh, who had a lot of success in Malaysia. And he helped exercise a lot of things. Although it wasn't his particular specialty, a very intelligent guy, a great teacher. And, but he, he told some stories about apparently Malaysia, Singapore, those areas are really rife with weird entities, oh. very much so. And because I, I guess people are open to that, or because you know, the people's minds are linked to that, something like that. And uh, he had some amazing stories. And then I took it because of that. One Catholic guy called me up from the diocese once and said, I have a case of a lady who was originally Jewish, but then was afflicted by some swami of some kind and has been <laughs> afflicted for years. And then she converted to Catholicism in order to have our exorcist come and deal with her, but we couldn't deal with her. And could you bring a Lama exorcist in case you know one to help her out? So then I called this friend of mine, this it was a really excellent Lama. We went down there, and we met this woman, and she told this story about how her kundalini had been let loose on her in a bad way by an irresponsible swami who then took off back to Hyderabad or whatever, something, some story like that. And for years, she'd been <laughs> like this, you know, and she had some aunts or something taking care of her, and she was in a terrible, painful state. And she had visions all the time when she tried to sleep of some people around a fire and some yogis in India, and they would poke their chimtas in a fire thing, and then she'd have an agony shooting up here and there because her kundalini was all loose. And, and I was a really bad... So this lama, he listens to this, and then he's like, well, 
Why don't you try Dong Len? And like these terrible pains, you know. And he, well, first he was pretty good. He gave out a caveat. He said, look, this happened to you in your mind with, uh, through some sort of a Swami guy. You should have a Hindu guy come along. And who is uh, like a Kundalini expert, you know, like one of these Shaktipat people. Have them come and maybe they, they'd be much more attuned to whatever is going on than I am. So he tried it. But, then, but you know, well, I'll try something. She was open to saying that. So then he said, then he, then he tried a few things. Then he, he also prayed, and said, that was, she liked that. But then he said, he got encouraged by her liking some of those first steps. And then he said, try Donglen. And when this terrible pain happens, then think you are taking the pain away from millions of beings, and you know, you're uh -huh. practicing yoga, Donglen. And she became irate. <laughs> <laughs> How could you add this me to add to my pain by taking on pain? It didn't work at all. We had to flee. <laughs> no, it didn't work. Okay. <laughs> so it's tricky. It's a whole. People need training, you know. And I think okay. I think that these doctors, if they're open to that, they could find some people. You know, we could. You know, there, there could be. There are networks. I'm sure in Baltimore. I have no doubt. There are networks, and uh, actually, some of the good. Women voodoo priests in Haitian communities, in case there's a bunch of Haitian taxi drivers there, as there are in, in Brooklyn, then they always have people who are very good at that, actually. No, they do. Voodoo is not just hexing people. It also has a lot of knowledge of this kind. They so, does. So there's another really fun book. Oh, good. Oh, great. Yes, walking, dear. Walking Through Walls. That's the name oh, of yeah, the book? that's a fun book. I have recommend reading it. It's a true story from the son about the father in Florida who, you know, was the interior decorator to start with. Smith is the name of the author. Yes, Smith. Yes, yes, yes. Is so it Smith Richards? Some, may, maybe have a copy here. Oh, we do? Maybe you can Google it. And yeah. it's a fascinating, wonderful story about how he became this uh, incredible uh, exorcist person. His father, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and there are many stories of thing, the, the things that he did and how he dealt with this throwing this devil out, and it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful yeah. book if you're interested in the subject of, of exorcism. I would highly recommend reading it. It's really fun. Walking Through Walls, I think it's called. Yes, Walking Through Walls. Yeah. Yes. Sarita is going to tell us of a local. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Well, as, as someone who's done a lot of body work and, and also energy work and so forth, yes. I'm, I'm reminded of several streams of work that, you know, going back to Milam Wright and bioenergetics and your discussion with yes. Sarno is relating to what some in the body work field would call yeah. energy cysts or, yeah. you know, sort of a, 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 a held memory or somatic affect mm -hmm. of yeah. stuck energy or, you know, a trauma that's held in the body, which doesn't matter if you go in and repair the, the structure, the trauma has not been released. Yeah. And a lot of what I would think of as shamanic work or, you know, in the way of, for instance, Roger Volger, who was a Jungian analyst who would work with people who had all kinds of emotional and somatic disorders is giving the subconscious permission to release that sort yes. of affect or stuck energy. Yes. And in, in some ways it would seem that, you know, shamans give that permission yeah. for the subconscious to release in the environment of a, right. a, a transpersonal force mm -hmm. or what we could think of as magnetizing that negative or whatever to us because of our own stuck story or energy affect. Right. And, you know, I think I, I've been reading Asanga's um, Abhidharma Samutra, Samakaya, Oh, Abhidharma Samuchaya? Oh, yeah. Oh. Right. And, and it's interesting to see what he speaks about in that, in that context of the substratum of awareness. Yeah. Um, as being sort of this foundation of the subconscious or the thing that propels us. Yeah. Um, which, in some ways, it, seem, it would appear to me is that that's what we meet in the bardo, is our own of course. sort of story that yeah. propels us forward. Oh, that's supposed to be. The main thing of the Book of the Dead is to get people to work now on these right. things, to get ready for these things. There's a, 
in the back of this book, I translated, some, there's a lot more things in the Book of the Dead than the thing that people know as the Book of the Dead. And the Dharma practice natural liberation of the instincts, I as I translated. Do you and have it a is a special thing. What? Do, you, do you have a great closing? Oh, are we closing now? I think so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Natural liberation of the instinct. Some great prayer at the end or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Yes, let's do a closing. Let's read together as a closing. My usual closing, I already closed when we started, which is my, <laughs> here at Menla, my tradition, in addition to the Menla sleep yoga, we have the Menla consolation prize. Where? I said I'm not doing it again. Oh, Relax. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have like my teacher there, so he doesn't want to have me repeat the lesson. So I think we might read together as a closing. Yeah, we might read this one: the prayer for deliverance from the straits of the between. And uh, uh, yeah, we might read that together. As a closing, if we have time. It is actually, should we just quickly close? Yeah, yeah, there? there's time. Can we, is that all right, everybody? Lunch is in, in, in 20 minutes, suppose. Okay, so it's on page, oh, but you can't read, oh, I didn't make a Xerox. But you can meditate, some of you have it, it's page 108. Okay, if a few people have it, and you can read two, I'm sorry, I don't or have Or could you one. read a phrase and we repeat it? Or anybody not? else has one? Yeah, maybe anybody who has one, sit next to one person at least, and a few people more. And others can just meditate as we read, and please read loudly then, those few people who have it. Homage to the host of mentors, archetypes, and angels. Please guide me on the path with your great love. When I roam the life cycle driven by sheer error, may the oral transmission mentors lead me on the path of unwavering light of learning, thought, and meditation. And may their consort host of angels back me on the way, deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between, and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong delusion, may the Lord Vairochana lead me on the path of the clear light of reality, perfection, wisdom. May his consort Buddha Datishvari back me on the way, Deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong hate, may the Lord Vajrasattva lead me on the path of the clear light of the mirror wisdom. May his consort Buddha Lochana back me on the way. Deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong pride, May Lord Radnasambhava lead me on the path of the clear light of the equalizing wisdom. May his consort Buddha Mamaki back me on the way, deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between, and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong passion, may the Lord Amitabha lead me on the path of the clear light of discriminating wisdom. May his consort Buddha Pandaravasini back me on the way, Deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong envy, may the Lord Amogasiddhi lead me on the path of the clear light of the all-accomplishing wisdom. May his consort Buddha Samayatara back me on the way, deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by the five strong poisons, May the Lord victors of the five clans lead me on the path of the clear light of the four wisdoms in combination. May the five consort Buddhas back me on the way and deliver me from the impure lights of the six realms, delivering me from the dangerous straits of the between. May they carry me to the five supreme pure lands. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong instincts, may the hero scientists lead me on the path of the clear light of orgasmic wisdom. May their best consort angel hosts support me from behind, deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between, and carry me to the perfect Buddhahood. When I roam the life cycle driven by strong hallucinations, may the host of mild and fierce lords lead me on the way of the light that conquers terrifying visions of hate and fear. 
May the space goddess angel hosts back me on the way, deliver me from the dangerous straits of the between, and carry me to perfect Buddhahood. Hey, may the space elements not arise as enemies, and may I behold the realm of the sapphire Buddha. May the water elements not arise as enemies, and may I see the realm of the diamond Buddha. May the earth elements not arise as enemies, and may I behold the realm of the golden Buddha. May the fire elements not arise as enemies, and may I behold the realm of the ruby Buddha. May the wind elements not arise as enemies, and may I behold the realm of the emerald Buddha. May the rainbow elements not arise as enemies, and may I behold the realm of the rainbow Buddha. May sounds, lights, and rays not arise as enemies, and may I behold the magnificent realm of the mild and fierce Lord. May I know all sounds as my own sounds. May I know all lights as my own lights. May I know all rays as my own rays. May I know the between's reality as mine. And may I realize the realm of the three Buddha bodies. Hey, now when the life between dawns upon me, I will abandon laziness as life has no more time. Unwavering, enter the path of learning, thinking, and meditating, and taking perceptions and mind as the path. I will realize the three bodies of enlightenment. This once that I have attained the human body is not the time to stay on the path of distractions. Hey, now when the dream between dawns upon me, here's lucid dreaming, I will give up corpse-like sleeping in delusion and mindfully enter unwavering the experience of reality. Conscious of dreaming, I will enjoy the changes as clear light. Not sleeping mindlessly like an animal, I will cherish the practice merging sleep and realization. Hey, now when the meditation between dawns upon me, I will abandon the host of distracting errors, focus in extreme free experience without releasing or controlling and achieve stability in the creation and perfection stages. Giving up busyness, now one-pointed in meditation, I won't surrender to the power of erroneous addictions. <laughs> hey, now when the death point between dawns upon me, I will give up the preoccupations of the all-desiring mind, enter unwavering the experience of the clarity of the precepts, and transmigrate into the birthless space of inner awareness. About to lose this created body of flesh and blood, I will realize it to be impermanent illusion. Hey, now when the reality between dawns upon me, I will let go of the hallucinations of instinctive terror, enter the recognition of all objects as my mind's own visions, and understand this as the pattern of perception in the between. Come to this moment, arrived at this most critical cessation, I will not fear my own visions of deities mild and fierce. Hey, now when the existence between dawns upon me, I will hold my will with mind one-pointed and increase forcefully the impulse of positive evolution. Blocking the womb door, I will remember to be revulsed. Now courage and positive perception are essential. I will give up envy and contemplate all couples as my spiritual mentor, father, and mother. With mind, then a quote, with mind distracted, never thinking, quote, death is coming, unquote, to slave away on the pointless business of mundane life and then to come out empty, it is a tragic error. Recognition of necessity, is the holy teaching of the gods. So won't you live this divine truth from now on?" End quote. These are the words of the great adepts. If you don't put the mentor's precept in your mind, won't you be the one who deceives yourself? <laughs> OK. No consolation prize, don't worry. But the main thing is, change your context. Be, live in a world that, that is basically good. That's very difficult to do in our culture.
but it gives you an inner level of relaxation that is different. California, I can say. Very harder to do in New York than California. Anyway, closing, thank you so much, Dale Borglum. And thank you, Robert Thurman. From Denmark. <laughs> the man from the Dane, the Danish yogi. Thank you so much for coming, really. And I hope this is the first of many visits to I, ho I, I hope so, And you too. don't always have to have me bugging you. You know, <laughs> you can just it's teach been by a, yourself It's been a true pleasure. What? You know, Trungpa Rinpoche said that he thought it was impossible to get enlightened in California because it's too easy. Well, <laughs> in his life, it didn't happen to him to get enlightened in California. No, it didn't. But next life, who, who knows where Trungpa is? He may have been reborn in an easier place. You never Oops, know. Oops, wrong one. Just because they have an official one in Tibet doesn't mean he's not around. Yeah. Right? <sighs> you know, technically, Nirmanakaya means, you know, they can be born in many embodiments simultaneously. You know oh, I didn't know that. Thank you. Would you mind signing? Not at all. You're going to have to tell me your name one more last time. What? I. I. L. L. T. E. E. Oh, Elena. Elena. Elena.